Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Sprawled out over approximately 3,470 square miles of desert and prairie badlands in the U.S. state of South Dakota is the Oglala Lakota Native American Reservation known as the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. The area is imbued with a rather dark history, such as being the location of the infamous 1890 battle at Wounded Knee, where U.S. soldiers mercilessly massacred hundreds of Lakota Sioux, including scores of women and children, and a bloody assault. Here is also a place of natural splendor and surreal views of hills, plateaus, and prairies, as well as many legends, myths, and mysteries inhabited by the native people, a diverse array of flora and fauna, and by some accounts, a supernatural denizen from beyond our understanding. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. One very eerie phantom that is said to have long prowled the region of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota is a mysterious, dark shadow figure known to wander about in the night on inscrutable errands. Commonly called Walking Sam, as well as Big Man and Tall Man, this entity is said to be around seven feet in height, with a lanky build, long arms, and a face devoid of any facial features although descriptions can vary. In some cases, the apparition is said to have two glowing red eyes. In others, he is described as wearing what appears to be a cloak or a stovepipe hat, while in others, still, it is merely an amorphous humanoid shadow. One weird description of the entity was written of in Peter Mathiason's 1983 book about Pine Ridge called The Spirit of Crazy Horse, in which he gives an account by a Lakota medicine man thus. There is your big man standing there, ever waiting, ever present like the coming of a new day. He is both spirit and real being, but he can also glide through the forest, like a moose with big antlers, as though the trees weren't there. I know him as my brother. I want him to touch me, just a touch, a blessing, something I could bring home to my sons and grandchildren that I was there, that I approached him, and he touched me." This wandering wraith is speculated to be everything from a ghost to a demon to some supernatural figure such as a skinwalker or a shadow person. But in every case it is described as being distinctly evil. Sometimes it is seen merely wandering aimlessly about, as if searching for something. At other times, it has been seen walking along roads, even hitchhiking, and in more sinister reports, it is said to kidnap people to carry them away into the night. In every case, it is seen as a menacing, malevolent entity to be avoided. One possible account of Walking Sam 
comes from a witness who was driving one evening just outside of Eagle Butte, South Carolina, when he was allegedly confronted by two frightening beings described as being translucent and with hideous visages. He would bizarrely describe the entities as, it was glowing like a real dim light bulb, you can see through it, eyes were size of human, really long nose, long in length, it has a really big mouth, its arms were like sticks, they were parallel to each other. The two sticks looked like they were glowing. It was around four foot tall, but its arms stretched. The other one on the left-hand side of the road had a face like a beast, horrifying, ugly, looked wrinkly, walked like a squat about the size of a goat. It was glowing too, reddish brown. It was wide and narrow. Even weirder than this confusing description, one of the creatures apparently phased into the witness's car and rode along with him in the passenger seat for several miles before vanishing into thin air. Another report was from someone who reached out to me in response to my own experience with a roving band of strange individuals who claimed that he had had a somewhat similar experience, this time in South Dakota, not far from the Pine Ridge Reservation, in fact. He claimed that he'd been driving along at night and that he had seen a dark, hunched-over form pacing about at the side of the road. He seemed to be hitchhiking. When he pulled over, he had been met with the sight of a very tall, lanky man dressed in a cloak and top hat who did not have a face and who approached the vehicle to demand to be let in and given a ride, even banging on the side of the vehicle. The witness drove off in a panic, and when he later relayed his experiences to locals, he was told that this was Walking Sam, the tall man. This was indeed the account that spurred me to look into this to begin with, as I had never heard of it before. It seems that in some recent accounts, the specter has been blamed as appearing to people in order to encourage them to commit suicide. In 2009, teenagers on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation began to report of being approached by a very tall, wraith-like, shadowy figure which they claimed was Walking Sam and who reportedly spoke to them and told them to kill themselves. During these encounters, the victims claimed that they had felt mysteriously compelled by the being's words, as if some command was worming into their brain to force them to bend to its will. Many of the people of the area truly believe that this is more than just superstition and folklore, and that this is literally a real entity that is on some dark mission. One tribal elder made a statement during a tribal council meeting claiming that even the police knew of this phantom, which blogger Mike Crowley wrote of thus. The woman, who was elderly but otherwise quite lucid, described Walking Sam as a big man in a tall hat who has appeared around the reservation and caused young people to commit suicides. She said that Walking Sam has been picked up on the police scanners but that the police have not been able to protect the community from him. She described him as a bad spirit. She wanted help from Washington with foot patrols for the tribal communities to protect them from Walking Sam. If any of this is true, then it apparently worked on at least some occasions, as throughout the years there were more suicides and in 2013 there was a spate of five suicides on the reservation. By 2014, it was reported that there were at least 103 official suicide attempts on the reservation over a period of several months, although some claimed it was more like 240, and nine of these between the ages of 12 and 14 actually succeeded. Many of these were carried out by hanging, and eerily it was claimed by Oglala Sioux Tribe Vice President Thomas Poor Bear that there had been found nooses hung out in the wilds near a place called Porcupine, and that when authorities had gone to remove them, they had found that a group of teenagers had congregated there for the purpose of committing a mass suicide. Of course, according to them, Walking Sam had told them to do it. While many people of the area attribute all of this to a mysterious phantom interloper, there are others who see this as just a vestige of folklore intertwining with the rampant poverty and drug abuse seen on the reservation. After all, this is one of the poorest areas of the nation, 
and more than 60% living below the poverty line, and many turning to drugs or alcohol to try and drown their sorrows. In addition, much of the badlands this region encompasses is wholly unsatisfactory for farming. There is little clean water, medical care is poor, and this might as well be a developing country situated right in the United States. In light of this, it seems that the suicide rate is bound to jump, as people with no way out make one for themselves. And indeed, the suicide rate for reservations such as this are well above the average. In this sense, perhaps the existence of Walking Sam may be a way to explain the reason for all of this misfortune. Mike Crowley had said of this, Walking Sam may be just one such explanation that resonates among some of the Lakota for teen suicides. It shouldn't distract the reader from the fact that people on the reservations are distraught. Whether Walking Sam represents Bigfoot, an evil spirit, or is just a manifestation of the fear that people have about losing their loved ones to what seems an incomprehensible type of event, the teen suicides are real. In the end, we're left to ponder just what it is that's going on here in this sparsely populated stretch of desolation. What sort of ancient spirit is stalking these lands, and does it have any connection to any phenomena reported elsewhere? Could this be skinwalkers, a ghost, a demon, or some other supernatural entity from lore? Or is this all just native superstitions, myth, and urban legend? There is really no way to know, but the people who have witnessed this dark stranger certainly seem to be convinced of what they have seen. Whether it is all real or not, one is left to wonder if this tall man with no face, this walking Sam, is really out there wandering the wilderness of South Dakota, and if he is, just what he or it wants. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. I spent the night in a graveyard. Well, kind of. We actually went on a series of nights, most recently Halloween, and that time I went alone. Why go to a glitzy, Hollywood-induced costume party when you can celebrate it the old-fashioned way with a good old ghost hunt? A proper stakeout with coffee and biscuits. We went armed with a torch, digital camera, voice recorder, and of course our own senses and judgment probably the most important tool of all, but also the one most prone to error. Amateurish tech by proper ghost hunting standards, I know, but you have to start somewhere. We were in the Scottish town of Troon, specifically an old graveyard and church ruins on the outskirts called Crosby Kirkyard. It dates back to 1681, but an older church apparently stood on the site as far back as the 1200s, so we're talking really old here. It was officially closed in 1868 when the town got a bigger cemetery and the gates have been locked ever since. According to legend, the roof of the church blew off during a storm the same night Robert Burns, Scotland's national poet, was born in the nearby town of Eyre. However, that tale sounds apocryphal and made up. What's more interesting is a poem made about the place by one John Lang, alleging it to be haunted by ghosts and spunkies. That would be ghosts and strange lights. Again, don't just take my word for it. All of this info can be found online. This is a real place with a real history. 
If you know the local area well enough, there are a few ways to get there, the most direct being through the woods. The gate is permanently locked and the wall more or less insurmountable, though there is a way in by standing on a tree stump around one side and mounting part of the wall. The cemetery at night was a petrifying thought when I was younger, so simply being there in the dark felt like something of an achievement. The hardest part was probably entering in. You're never sure what's over the other side of that wall. I almost had to remind myself that somewhere in here was the resting place of a one-time assassin named David Hamilton, though most say it was really his brother who was guilty and that David was just part of the plot, but that's a debate for another day. My photos were fairly spooky in themselves, showing dark trees and ruins looming up against a gray sky, not to mention the jagged metal of the cemetery gate, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. A few dust specks, maybe. Then I set down my voice recorder and we exited the graveyard, hoping to pick up something in our absence, and returned a half hour later. Just as the novelty of all of it was wearing off, we took a seat on an overturned gravestone – sorry, dead person – and were gazing at the stars when a white streak of light came zooming past right above us. My friend thought it might be a shooting star, but it seemed much too low and small. Shooting stars travel in an arc, whereas this light just shot straight by in a perfect line. If that was weird, it was about to get even weirder. As we set out on our way home, another one of these lights appeared just over the ruined church, zooming into the tree line. It was lucky I turned my head round at that moment to catch it. I wonder how many lights there were that we didn't see. There was no doubting at this time, it was way too low and minuscule to be a shooting star. I can only describe these lights as tiny white balls or globes which traveled very fast. Either it was a ghost, whatever that might be, or I witnessed a strange light phenomenon, possibly something similar to what we might now call will-o'-the-wisps or something we don't know about yet. Maybe these lights were the Spunkies reported in John Lang's poem centuries earlier. Spunky is an old Scots word which basically means a strange light or glowing. The following evening, I listened back to the audio from my voice recorder, all 27 minutes of it, and I did find something, however faint. In between the gentle wind and car noises is what sounds like a tap, followed by three or four footsteps. I rewound and compared it with my own footsteps at the start of the recording, and the sound was practically identical. I also tried reproducing the tap sound by touching the screen of the phone and playing it back, and that too sounded quite similar. The whole segment is unique in the whole footage. Was it simply another person, you might ask? Well, although a main road runs nearby, barely anyone walks this way, especially at night. It's a bit out of the way. Type in Crosby Churchyard on Google Maps and you'll see what I mean. And I think it's a pretty fair assumption that we were the only weirdos going into this place that night. I suppose the likeliest explanation is an animal, but the footsteps sounded too slow and heavy to be a squirrel or rabbit, though that's just my own personal judgment. Nothing happened on the other nights, but that still can't diminish our experiences from the first time. Beginner's luck, I suppose. In fact, the only vaguely paranormal thing we encountered on the second night was a noise outside my friend's house on the homeward journey. Then the thought came to me that what we call the paranormal probably works in a very funny way, or bizarre as it sounds, like fishing. You can go ten times and only catch something once or twice. All my run-ins with ghosts so far have that kind of theme. There's something there, not overly clear or discernible, but still quite out of the ordinary, then in an instant it's gone or doesn't show up again. It's not as if you can catch it up close and take it back to test in a lab. But you know, there was definitely a weird element about the experience. I don't give much credit to feelings of being watched or of a presence. 
After all, that you feel scared is a fact about yourself, not your surroundings. But I suppose it's not a bad thing to say that at no point in the investigation was I genuinely frightened or alarmed. I even liked it in there, the magical stillness of it all. If one thing's for sure, it's that the dead are less likely to harm you than the living. But whether they are all truly at rest, I still can't say. The following is an old African-American folktale that, while probably not true, is entertaining nonetheless. There was a man who had a farm and a farmhouse with a nice big front room. He lived there alone after his wife had died. His wife had loved one thing in this world more than anything else, and it wasn't her husband. It was to play the piano sitting in that front room. When she was alive, she would sit there every night and hit those keys to make beautiful music. And when it came time for her to leave this world, she called her husband to her bedside and made him promise that he would never, ever sell that piano or move it from the house. That's how much she loved that piano. So for years, that's what the man did. He just let the piano sit there. But came time, he was getting old and getting tired of taking care of that big farm and that big house. He decided he wanted to sell the house and move somewhere smaller. So he started to pack up all of his things and move his furniture out of the house. He had his bed and his sofa and all his other furniture sitting out on the porch ready to move away. And then he went to move that piano. He hauled that piano out onto the porch with the rest of the furniture. Well, that piano just lifted up its legs and walked right back to where it had been sitting all those years. The man hauled it out onto the porch again, but the piano got up again and walked right back to where it had been before. And this went on and on. The piano would not go. Finally, the man got so angry about it, he said he would pay a whole bunch of money to anyone who could move that piano. There was an old root woman who lived nearby. Everybody went to root women in those days to take care of any kind of unusual problem. This old root woman heard that the man was offering a whole bunch of money to anyone who could move that piano, and she thought that she sure would like a whole bunch of money, and that a piano that moved by itself was a mighty unusual problem. So she reckoned that she was just the one to take care of it. So she went to the old man and told him that she was the one to move that piano and that she'd be dancing in hell if she couldn't move it. The man told her to get her roots and such and see what she could do. When the root woman came back, her mother was walking right behind her, yelling at her. Her daughter had told her what she had said about the dancing in hell and that root woman's mother was going on and on about people making big promises and saying what they had hoped would happen to them if they couldn't keep those promises and how they could come to regret saying what they had hoped would happen to them if they couldn't do what they said they would do. But that root woman didn't listen to her mother. She took her roots and such and started trying to move the piano. She got it out onto the porch. But the same thing happened again. That piano got up and started moving. Only this time, that piano was moving fast. So fast that it knocked that root woman down and it killed her and she died. And now, everybody says that they believe that she is dancing in hell. The Ridges Asylum, formerly the Athens Lunatic Asylum, was a facility for the mentally ill, opened on January 9, 1874, in Athens, Ohio. The state had recruited Thomas Kirkbride, a founding member of the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Institutions for the Insane, to design the facility. He believed that asylums should be large, self-sufficient communities and thought it was therapeutic for patients to be in a place that resembled a home. The main building was four stories high with two wings, separating patients by gender. Patients were then divided into ten different groups based on their diagnosis. They also housed patients based on the severity of their illnesses. 
The most violent lived in the farthest wings of the facility, with those non-violent, non-exhibiting severe symptoms being kept closer to the center of the building, where they could mingle with hospital staff. As the years wore on, the facility began to become overcrowded due to constant influx of patients being admitted. By the 1950s, the asylum was over three times its capacity, as they housed over 2,000 patients. Modern-day treatment of people with mental illness still leaves much room for improvement, and looking back, what transpired at the Ridges Asylum is truly terrifying. The facility closed in 1993 and is currently run by Ohio University. Dr. Walter Freeman first made a name for himself treating patients during World War II at a Veterans Affair hospital. Doctors there noted that he and his partner were treating patients with mental illness by cutting into the skull and slicing through neural fibers in the brain. Freeman really pushed the boundaries of practicing ethical medicine, essentially having no regard for the patient's ownership of their own bodies. He advocated for VA psychiatrists who were not trained in surgery to be able to perform lobotomies themselves, and figured, since they were already in there, they should remove samples of brain tissue for further testing. This sounds like a serious and painful procedure, because it absolutely is. Freeman didn't use typical anesthetics for his lobotomies. He used electroshock. Antonio Egas Moniz is credited with creating the lobotomy, a procedure that was intended to treat those with mental illness. Although there are several ways to perform a lobotomy, the procedure itself is fairly simple. You have your patient and your pick. You drive your pick through your patient's eye socket. The pick would be placed just above the eyelid and eyeball and hammered into the skull. From there, the pick would be used to sever connections in the front of the brain. A nurse at the asylum reported that the procedure sounded like cloth tearing. The frontal lobe is typically responsible for personality, behavior, and voluntary movement, making it a prime location for correcting what was seen as undesirable thoughts or behavior during that time. This procedure became increasingly popular, and instead of it being used only in severe cases, the lobotomy was used to treat lively kids whose parents just wanted a docile child, insomnia, depression. Patients rarely remembered anything about the procedure or Dr. Walter Freeman, which is unsurprising given that they had been shocked and had their frontal lobes scrambled. Mental illnesses can differ vastly from patient to patient, by diagnosis, and even day to day. Early healthcare professionals and staff believed they had cutting-edge technology in the treatment of those in their care. However, it was rather barbaric. Lobotomies, shock therapy, and ice water drips were all used on hospitalized patients before medication became commonplace treatment in the 70s. The asylum became a dumping ground for family members who felt like they had nowhere to turn. While some patients battled schizophrenia, others were admitted due to menopause, postpartum depression, tuberculosis, or certain disabilities. Eventually, the grounds blossomed, the facility grew to include cottages, an amusement hall, and even a farm. Some say the farm at the ridges was self-sufficient, and they're right to a point. The farm at the asylum raised cattle and pigs, had an orchard and a general farm, all of which needed tending to, and this is where the patients came in. It was believed that physical work was therapeutic, and who could argue that someone in a mental institution couldn't benefit from raising animals for slaughter? Thankfully, by the 1950s, the Ridges reverted back to outsourcing their labor as, much like the prison system, there were complaints over the use of free labor. 53-year-old Margaret Schilling was a patient at the asylum in 1978, and by this time the patient population had drastically decreased. This was largely due to the fact that regular hospitals had begun to accept patients that would have been sent to state-run asylums. As hospital records are still sealed, not much is known about Margaret's past, her treatments, or why she was even in the asylum to begin with. At this time, certain patients were allowed to move freely within the asylum and the grounds, 
though they had to be back in the building and accounted for at the end of the day. This policy is what allowed Margaret to wander off into a rather isolated part of the building. That frigid December night, staff members were unable to find Margaret. This winter was rather historic, being one of the coldest on record. They searched the building, the attic, the grounds, and the attic again. They called out for her. She was gone. Six weeks went by before they found her. Because of the smell. Margaret was found dead in the attic. Her naked body was in the middle of the concrete floor, her clothing neatly folded and stacked on the windowsill. It was now January of 1979, and Highway Patrol had to be called out to assist in moving the body. Strangely, underneath Margaret's body was a mark. It was the shape of her body, and it couldn't be removed. Workers scrubbed and scrubbed and couldn't get it to come out. Some paranormal investigators and fans of lore believe the stain to be haunted. It attracts television shows, journalists, and brazen bypassers who choose to break in just to be able to touch Margaret Schilling's final resting place. However, the case may not be as mysterious as they want to believe. Some staffers feel as though Margaret intentionally went up to the attic to die. This doesn't explain the duration of time that she was missing, nor does it help clarify how her body was found in the same place that had been searched multiple times before. But the stain? There is some science behind that. Some graduate students analyzed the stain in 2008 and found that the cause of the stain was simply the way her body had begun to decompose combined with the harsh and toxic 70s cleaning products used to sterilize the area. Essentially, they unknowingly sealed an imprint of a deceased patient into the concrete. There are rumors that Margaret may have been hearing impaired or perhaps she had been over-medicated by asylum staff, both reasonable possibilities behind why she may not have been able to respond to the search team when they tried to find her. It's heartbreaking, though, to know that she died alone in freezing temperatures, away from her husband and locked away in an asylum. Perhaps those who hypothesize her death was intentional, an act of willful suicide, would prefer to think she died on her own terms rather than at the hands of a flawed medical system. It's not necessarily uncommon for a cemetery to be nearby a church or hospital, but the Ridges Asylum had a few with more than 1,900 people buried on the property. Many of the gravestones are only marked by number and are the final resting place for veterans, patients, and cadavers used by Ohio University. Oddly, one graveyard has all of the headstones arranged in a circle. This is allegedly considered a circle of power by some witches and those who practice black magic, though some think this was simply a very misguided prank pulled by the students in the 1920s. Across from the asylum is another cemetery, separated by a creek. Several graves are accessible by a bridge and are said to be home to murderers. Fearing these spirits are sinister, many people believe the alleged murderers were laid to rest there because spirits can't cross water. Jim Jack Croc, an alligator, was brought to the grounds by an employee in the 1950s. He was one of three alligators, but he was, for some reason, the most famous. During the warmer months, Jack lived in the fountain on the grounds, but he was moved to a plastic kiddie pool in the basement. One has to wonder about the psychological and ecological effects of three alligators living on the grounds of a mental health treatment institution. As with any older building, many people believe the Ridges Asylum is haunted. Thanks to folklore and media representation, mental health institutions are believed to be dark, evil places filled with sad and angry spirits. One rumor tells the tale of a college student who broke into the grounds after they had closed in 1993. They allegedly found Margaret's body stain and touched it, which led to being tormented by ghosts, so much so that they ended up killing themselves. Although the asylum closed in 1993, Ohio University took over the building. They renovated parts of the facility to create an art museum, 
studios, and offices. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Dear Weird Darkness, so glad I found your podcast. Love your show, keep up the good work. I'm the case manager of a paranormal investigation team in Sacramento, California. This story is about my husband Robert and his first investigation with the team. In order to understand, I have to give you a little background about my husband. He's a Vietnam veteran who was wounded on his second tour. He was wounded in a running firefight by three hand grenades. He was hit in both arms, both legs, and has a plate in his head, but to meet him you would never know it. He had been pronounced dead at one point, so now likes to tell me that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Robert is a Marine and part of Third Force Recon just after the Tet Offensive. He wasn't quite 18. He was part of an eight-man team and the only survivor. One rode a motorcycle into a brick wall, another walked into the China Sea and the rest died due to Agent Orange. He doesn't speak much of those years, and I don't push it. We were going to investigate the Washu Club in Virginia City, Nevada, a ghost town with a population of more dead than alive souls. It was late at night, and we were on the second floor. These old buildings have halls that connect many of the rooms and shorter entryways from the main hall to the room. We were sitting side by side on folding chairs watching the main hall. The main hall goes to the ballroom. Suddenly Robert asked me if I had seen them. No, I responded. I hadn't seen anything. I could hear the agitation in his voice. This is a man that does not rattle easily. Then he got up and started toward the hall and going from room to room. I saw you, he said. What do you want? Now I have become concerned. I could hear it in his voice as he kept asking from room to room. Finally, he asked our friends if they had seen someone, smelled something strange. They responded that they hadn't seen anyone, but they had smelled something. It smelled damp, humid, and a bit like body odor. You must remember that this was in the beginning of April, and Virginia City was just above freezing, so body odor would generally not be a problem. When I finally got Robert to tell me what he had seen, what he had seen was his seven guys going down the hall in two lines, just as they would have when heading to get their orders. He thought they had come for him. We sat down later and came up with a more accurate explanation. The Washu Club has been known over the years for having some not-nice spirits. They were there to protect him. Later we got confirmation. When Robert goes on investigations, nothing will happen when he's in a room, but once he leaves the activity will amp up. We now have Robert watch the monitors. St. Paul's Episcopal Church Cemetery in Alexandria, Virginia is home to a most peculiar grave, one that bears no name, only a haunting inscription, to the memory of a female stranger. The identity of the soul at rest beneath the headstone remains a mystery attracting visitors and inspiring ghostly tales since at least 1833. The inscription in its entirety reads as follows. To the memory of a female stranger whose mortal sufferings terminated on the 14th day of October, 1816. Aged 23 and 8 months, this stone is placed here by her disconsolate husband in whose arms she sighed out her latest breath and who under God did his utmost even to soothe the cold, dead ear of death. 
how loved, how valued once avails thee not, to whom related or by whom begot, a heap of dust alone remains of thee. Tis all thou art, and all the proud shall be. To him give all the prophets witness, that though his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10th chapter, 43rd verse. The poetic verses are taken from Alexander Pope's 1717 poem, Elegy to the Memory of an Unfortunate Lady, with a few alterations. The first print mention of the grave of the female stranger appears to be in a poem published in the Alexandria Gazette in 1834 which details a visit to the tomb. The poem was published under the initials S.D. and later revealed to be the work of poet Susan Rigby Dallum Morgan of Baltimore, Maryland. Ms. Morgan also wrote about the grave in her column for the Philadelphia Sunday Courier under the pen name Lucy Seymour. In an entry from 1836, Morgan wrote that the stranger had been a foreign woman of tearful face and a pale complexion, who traveled with a male companion said to be her husband, though locals doubted this claim. According to Morgan, the only soul that the stranger confided in before her passing was a local pastor, whose name is also lost to time. Articles about the female stranger continued to surface throughout the years, growing more mysterious with each publication. In 1848, the Alexandria Gazette published a letter that claimed the grave belonged to a woman of pale complexion who was accompanied by a disreputable man. The companion gave his surname as Claremont and paid his bills with $1,500 in counterfeit English currency. An 1886 version, published in the Hyde Park Herald, added such dark Gothic details as a doctor sworn to secrecy and a reclusive husband who kept his wife's face hidden behind a veil and forbade anyone to speak to her or attend her funeral. An account published in the Washington Evening Star suggested that the female stranger and her male companion were doomed lovers. Yet another penned by Colonel Fred Massey in the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette in 1887 adds that the lovers were European nobles who absconded to Alexandria and that the female stranger died in her husband's arms with their lips locked in a final kiss. The husband buried his partner in secrecy, then disappeared from town only to return in the dead of night and exhume her body to take it with him. While little in the way of concrete proof, multiple theories as to the true identity of the female stranger have circulated. Some are comic in their outlandishness. One suggests that the female stranger was in fact Napoleon Bonaparte in drag, while others possess a whiff of truth. A persistent theory claims that the female stranger is actually Theodosia Burr Alston, the daughter of Vice President Aaron Burr, who disappeared at sea some four years before the recorded death date of the female stranger. Whoever she was, if she existed at all, the female stranger has left a lasting impression on Alexandria. Tourists visit her grave to this day. The stranger's spirit, too, still lingers. She is said to have died in Room 8 at the nearby Gadsby's Tavern. Some claim that her ghost haunts the room in which she passed and can be seen standing at the window and gazing out the glass. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story 
You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.